Hello and welcome to my master's presentation. My project, Evaluating Replanting Priority Using GIS, revolves around the development of a practical tool to simplify the decision-making process when it comes to prioritizing replanting efforts after wildfires in California. In August 2020, two wildfires were ignited by a passing lightning storm in Monterey County. The larger of these two fires, officially dubbed the River Fire Incident, began in the hilly country south of Salinas and consumed just over 48,000 acres in 19 days. This particular fire has an element of personal interest for me. I was living with my family in Monterey County at the time, and I remember the initial plumes of smoke rising up from the River Fire and its sister incident, the Carmel Fire. Those plumes soon resulted in air quality warnings across the county, as the particulate load made the air difficult to breathe and a health risk for the very young and the very old. The fires also prompted evacuation orders, and thousands were forced to leave homes and possessions behind and search for temporary accommodation and logistical support. I assisted with food and clothing distribution as my parents helped families find hotel rooms, church sanctuaries, or local gymnasiums where they could live temporarily. It was, the first, it was the first time that a significant fire had touched Monterey County in a decade. It would not be the last. Wildfires are... Sorry, my slide decided to advance about me. Wildfires are occurring more frequently over a longer period each year in California. And it seems unlikely that this trend will change anytime soon. Beyond the immediate effects, uncontrolled wildfires can cause damage that lasts long past the end of the fire incident. One variety of lasting damage is the sudden loss of vegetation, which is best addressed via rapid yet carefully planned replanting efforts. Of course, considering how large some wildfires can grow, immediately replanting the entire burn area is often impractical necessitating prioritization of key areas over less critically damaged regions. The aim of this project is the production of a GIS model that will simplify the replanting prioritization process for the decision makers by processing relevant data into a layer that includes both the polygons describing critical zones and replanting suggestions for those zones. I will first discuss the data sources used by the model before covering its methodology with the help of the River Fire case study. Conclusions and an opportunity for questions will follow. To establish priority areas, three factors were considered, burn severity, erosion, and slope. Burn severity was included on the grounds that the worst burnt areas would likely require the most urgent intervention. Erosion was added for consideration because of the role that vegetation plays in preventing erosion, and thus the areas at greatest risk should be replanted first. Slope was included for similar reasons to erosion, but with a specific eye towards unsecured soils increasing, increasing the risk of land or mudslides. In other words, the highest priority areas would be in erosion prone areas with significant slope badly affected by the fire. In regards to species uh, suggestions for replanting, the Forest Service maintains a data library describing the characteristics of various surveyed parcels of land, such as canopy cover and the percentage of trees present that are carnivorous. These characteristics can be used to determine which biome is applicable to each parcel. Once the biome is established, another reference indicates the species makeup and native seed package typical of the biome in that region. In this image, the gray lines delineate various parcels established by the Forest Service. Each of these parcels has attribution describing the vegetation present in that specific parcel. The red area is the extent of the river fire to serve as comparison to the extent of the parcels. Six sources were used for this project, three of them vector and three raster. All six data sets were created by government agencies and are publicly available online. Ideally, the end user of the model will be able to go online and acquire the data sets relevant to the incident that they are examining from these same publicly available websites. To 
demonstrate the model, I will be using the river flyer as a case study. As I mentioned before, I was in the affected area, though outside the actual incident area, while the fire was active. And I assisted in volunteer efforts to distribute food and clothes to the families evacuating from the blaze. The majority of the blaze occurred on hillsides and mountain slopes with variable vegetative land cover. Due to both my personal knowledge of the fire and the fact that the terrain it covered is ideal for examination using the model, I have chosen the, to use the 2020 River Fire as my case study. This is the current iteration of the model as viewed in ArcGIS Pro's model builder. Data preparation starts with the isolation of the county or counties encompassing the incident area from the county boundaries layer and the isolation of the specific incident from the larger incidents file. In both cases, these are isolated on the basis of name. However, since some of the incident names are used by multiple incidents, for example, a fire from the 1920s was also designated river fire, the newly isolated incident layer needs to be clipped to the new county layer to weed out duplicates. Once this is accomplished, all layers are reprojected to pro the projection used by the state of California, NAD83 California Teal Albers coordinate system in their official files. In this image on the side, you will see a layer labeled administrative boundaries, which represents the county boundaries file. The fire polygons file represents the Cal Fire um, incident storage. The uh, specific counties and specific incidents are selected out by attribute and then reprojected and then clipped a bit off the screen of the image itself. The first stage of the actual analysis involves generating a slope file from the DEM. I recommend taking the opportunity to open the slope file in a map to check for any irregularities. Next, the slope file is classified into polygons. The class isolates the range of slope percentages that are considered risky and the user is fully capable of editing the class definitions to fit their specific criteria. Similarly, the burn severity raster and the erosion rasters are classified to isolate the areas of interest. Then all classified rasters are converted into polygons. From the newly generated polygon layers, the polygons corresponding to the classes containing areas defined as risks are selected out into new layers. To ensure that the erosion and slope polygon sets match the scope of the study area, clip both polygon sets to the incident boundary polygon. Now, in some cases, the values that define the various classes weren't being preserved across the step for a reason I was not able to make clear. So I have the altered field transformers restoring the defining values in this case study. In other instances, these might not be necessary and can be removed at the user's discretion. Finally, the intersect tool is used to determine areas that have risky slopes, high erosion potential, and severe burn damage, i.e. the overlaps between the three-factor polygon sets. The pairwise intersect tool attaches the vegetation data from the Forest Service data set on a spatial basis to the areas of interest polygons producing the deliverable data set. Now, in terms of interpreting the Forest Service data, which is somewhat tricky, you will need the key for your regional data set available at the Forest Service's data clearinghouse in the same download section as the actual files themselves. The attached fields contain values that correspond to choices in the key. For example, in a pictured attribute table, Row 29 reports that 80% of the ape parcel is covered with trees and that all 80% is hardwood species, which would direct the interpreting user to a different section in the Forest Service key and ultimately to a list of species and seed packages that can be used to plan replanting efforts in that specific parcel. Now, to briefly revisit the case study, the river fire incident lasted for almost three weeks and consumed roughly 48,000 acres of Monterey County. Due to the hilly area, the prevailing winds, and the fuel load, the fire was difficult to access and to contain and resulted in significant damage to the burned area. 
Using this model, my model, 617 acres of the incident region have been identified as priorities for replanting. Divided up into 1,774 parcels, the majority of these parcels are on shrub-covered hillsides near the line of the hills running parallel north to south along River Road in the eastern part of the burn area. On the figure on the slide, the red polygons mark uh, the areas of concern identified by the model. While the stated goal, the production of a model to process relevant data to assist decision makers with replanting efforts has been completed, I think that there is plenty of room for further expansion with my model. For example, many factors that have an impact on prioritization are not currently included in the model, such as proximity to water bodies or developed areas, or the formations and compositions of the soil. On the other hand, the easily editable nature of the model shouldn't make further integration of these factors or other user priorities particularly difficult. As this model was constructed with the intent for dissemination and use, I'm eager to offer it up to anyone who is interested and invite potential users to contact me at alexanderwade at arizona.edu or at wade.alexander.j at gmail.com. I am willing and eager to walk any prospective users through the process of data acquisition and transformer customization. Thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions?